morning, church. Thanks for gathering and being a part this morning as we gather to continue in our series of in Psalms, a journey of worship. Last week we launched this series, and I really appreciated Keith walking us through Psalm 1, challenging me. What I choose to delight in will shape what I become. To me, the book of Psalms is, it meets me right where I am. And as I journey through life, as we journey through life, we walk through different situations, different things. Each of our journeys look different. And I think each of us find a connection, a way to relate to the different writings in Psalms. This morning we are going to be looking at Psalm 34. And as we unpack this psalm, I want us to see, I want us to think about, through the testing of God is an invitation to intimacy. David, he is, he's the writer of this psalm. And I'd like to give us some context of how this psalm or what was going on in David's life when he wrote this psalm. As you turn to your Bibles, uh, some of your Bibles may have just a beginning piece of that, a heading there. It says, of David, so he's the writer, he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he left. So what's going on in David's life at this stage? That sounds pretty crazy for him to to be acting like he's insane. As we look at David's life, God called David as a young man. He anointed him. He was anointed by Samuel. He was anointed to be the next king. And as he was anointed by God, it says the Spirit of God came upon him mightily. David was asked to serve Saul, who was the king. Saul had an evil spirit that came to him and troubled him at times, and David was a skilled harp player. And so when the spirit would come, they would call on David to come and to play his harp. And we we see in David's life that that God is with David, and he he kills Goliath, and after he kills Goliath, he's a part of the the army of Israel. He serves Saul in the military. And it says that every time that David went into into battle, that he had great success. And as as he continued to serve in the military, the people began to take notice. And as they would come back from the from the armies, from as they come back from the battle, the people would line the streets and they would and they would praise David. They would say, they would cry out and they would say, Saul has killed the thousands, but David his 10,000. And that created jealousy within Saul. Saul's fearing for his kingdom, and he, and he wants to kill David. He wants to take him out. Saul has a son, Jonathan, and Jonathan and David become really close friends. And in this friendship, Jonathan actually chooses a friendship with David over his relationship with his dad. And he helps David escape, and he flees. David finds himself in a place where he, he's not even safe in his own country. He's afraid. He doesn't know who he can trust. And so he actually flees to an enemy city, to the city of Gath. It's a Philistine city to hide from Saul. And it is there in the city of Gath that David is noticed by his enemies. And he's brought before the king, before King Abimelech, and he pretends to be insane. He slobbers, and he allows so much slobber to come out, it runs down his beard, and he scratches on the walls. He's, he's playing the insanity piece here. The king gets frustrated, and he And he says, why did you bring this guy in here? And he drives him out of his presence. And so David escapes. And this is the context 
that David writes this psalm. And again, as we share and as we unpack the psalm, David is being tested. He's going through a severe test, and he finds that in this time of testing, there's an incre- he finds an incredibly deep relationship with God. So we're willing to read Psalm 34, and I would just ask if you can, would you stand with me as we read the Word of God? Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ear is attentive to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems his servant. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for these incredible words. I thank you for these words that your servant David wrote in a time of great need in his life. And that he pours out his heart to you and that we can find trust, we can find assurance in these words. And Lord, I pray that as we look into your word that it would become alive and active in our hearts and lives today. Thank you for your word. I pray and ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. For you kids, I'm glad that you are with us this morning. And if you want to have a little assignment, you can take a piece of paper. And I want you to draw me a picture of your favorite food. What is your favorite food? And then after the service... I welcome you to come and share that with me. But as we begin to work our way through this psalm, I would like us to look at four main points. And the first point that I want to look at is is there's a call to worship. And we find this call in verses 1 through 3. And the second point that I want to look at is David's testimony of who God is. And that is in verses 4 through 7. The third point, and I believe this is, the most, uh, this is a key verse in Psalm 34. It holds an invitation for all of us. And as we look at this invitation, we want to unpack what is that invitation. And our last point being righteous living. How do we live righteously? And so let's go back and let's pick up in verse 1, a call to worship. As David begins this psalm, these first three verses, he is pouring out praise to God. 
And he's inviting us to join him in this praise. He says, I will extol the Lord. I will bless the Lord. I will praise him at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. And we get this picture of a person who has had this incredible experience and he just can't stop talking about it. He just wants to tell everybody what God has done for him. He goes up to anyone who will listen. He says, I want to tell you, would you just listen to what God has done for me? I want the world to know. They can't stop praising God. In verse 2, he says, my soul will boast in the Lord. David is taking no credit for what has happened. There's nothing that he has done it's nothing about him, but, it, but it's all about God. It's pointing to who God is and what God has done. Only God could have orchestrated such an amazing, incredible plan. David's life it was being threatened by Saul. Saul wanted to kill him. And he's running. He's trying to hide. He's trying to find a safe place. So he hides among the enemies among the Philistines, a place where he believes Saul won't go. Saul won't look for him there. But then his enemies recognize him, and David fears for his life. But in that moment, he sees and he experiences deliverance. Deliverance from his enemies but also from Saul. And David is saying to those who have lost hope, those who are suffering, those who are afflicted, they have nowhere to turn. He says, listen to my story. Listen to what God has done for me. Together, together let's praise God. Together let's worship He's saying God can do the same for you. God is able to do more than we ask or imagine. Take heart. Be encouraged. When we go through difficult times in life, there may come a time when we want to give up. We almost lose hope. But then we hear an amazing story of what God has done. And our hope begins to return. A friend may come beside us and gently take us by the arm and points us to God and and encourages us and says, let's together, let's praise God. The second point that I want to look at is in verses four to seven. And David here, he's giving a personal testimony of who God is. David begins to To become very honest, he opens up his life and he's telling, he's describing this God to us. He says, listen, hear me. God is an amazing God. He does not deal with us in shameful ways. He's a God that we can trust. He's a God who hears and he listens. He listens to my cry. And he also seen God as a protector. To be heard by God is amazing. But not only to be heard, but to have God respond to us. Have you ever been talking to somebody and, and they're distracted? They're, they're maybe on their phone, they're watching a video, or they're, they're just working through their phone, and you're trying to talk to them. Maybe they're reading something and and you know they're not paying attention because the response that you get is, sure, uh uh-huh. They're very distracted. That's not who God is. That's not how God communicates or works with us. He doesn't hold up his hand and say, give me a moment. I'm busy right now. I don't have time for you. No. He always hears He always has time. David goes on and says, he delivered me. He delivered me from all my fears. 
the fears that overwhelmed him, God met him right there. And he found God among those fears. Have you ever thought of how much fear is a part of our lives today? How much it impacts us? Those fears can come flooding into our minds, into our hearts, our lives each and every day. And we react to those fears. It could be a fear of losing our job or maybe our spouse. Being alone. A fear of finances, a lack of finances, a fear of dying. These fears affect us in crazy ways. There's a fear of failing, a fear of being rejected, being made fun of, not being included. Fear can be so crippling. It keeps us from doing things that would be good for us to be a part of, that would be healthy for us. But fear also causes us to to become angry, to become distant, to retreat, or to, to become unengaged. Have you ever stopped and thought about how much fear is a part of our lives from day to day? But in this relationship with God, David never found God to shame him. As we go on, it says, it shows us that shame was not a part of his relationship with God. David looked to God for help, and he found a God that who loved him, who delighted in him. David is saying there is never shame in running to God. God never shames us, and he's never ashamed of us. He doesn't seek to control us through shame or embarrassment. I believe that there's many people who live lives in shame. Maybe ashamed of what they've done, of the past. And they think that God is ashamed of them. Ashamed of a habit that they've tried to get rid of. We hang our heads and we're unable to look to God. We think that God is disappointed in us. In those times, we lose identity, we lose our value, and we can't receive the love that God has for us, that God wants us to receive. Now, I want to be very clear that God doesn't tolerate sin. When I sin, he doesn't just shrug it off and say, ah, it's not a big deal. No, God, he's a righteous God, he's a just God. And he comes through his Holy Spirit and he works within my life, drawing me back to himself, desiring for me to repent of my sin. But how God approaches me and how he reach out, reaches out to me is not through shame. He's not trying to change me by embarrassing me. In Hebrews 2, it speaks of Christ coming to this earth. He's dying on the cross, and he made it possible for us to be made right with God. Christ paid the incredible price. And the Father gave his Son so that we could be forgiven. Hebrews 2.11 says, Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Think about that. We are called children of God. We are made holy through Christ. And Christ is not ashamed to call us his children. He's not ashamed to call us a brother or a sister. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but he rejoices over you with singing. As you hear that verse, as you look at that verse, can't you feel God's heart in that verse? 
It's a very personal verse. He says, the Lord, your God, is with you. He delights in you. He loves you. He even sings over you. What an incredibly beautiful verse, a very profound thing to think about. What does it mean to be delighted in? What does it mean for the God of creation to delight in you? To rejoice over you. As you go throughout your day today, as you lay down to sleep tonight, think about that. Think about the God of the universe delights in you. He loves you. David refers to himself as a poor man. This was before he was a king. He was just a young man. But we can take comfort in knowing that no matter who we are, no matter our social status, whoever calls out to God, God hears, he cares, he protects, he rescues. The third point is an invitation for all. In verse 8, I believe this is the key verse to the chapter and this is where we find an amazing invitation for all of us and David he's been sharing how personally God how he has personally experienced God and now is it as if he stops and he says don't just take my word for it he says taste and see you yourselves try this taste and see that the Lord is good It is through the testing of God is his invitation to intimacy. And in these next few verses, in verses 8 through 11, there's actually two invitations here. Verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Verse 11, come my children, listen to me. Probably most of us like invitations or we may like trying something new. I'm not a great, I don't like or enjoy going and buying a new car, but when you go and you're looking at a new car, the the car salesman comes out and he wants to tell you all about this car. This car's been, the interior's been updated, the seats are amazing, it drives, it handles really well, it's smooth, and the engine is really incredibly powerful. And he's telling you all of these things about it. And then what's he say? Take it for a test drive, right? Check it out. Try it for yourself. Sit in it. See how it feels. Drive it. See for yourself how smooth it is. It's amazing, right? He's trying. He wants you to experience it for yourself. Some of you may want to go and check out reviews of a product that you're considering. You want to know what other people are saying about this. David here, he is in the midst of a hard and difficult test. It's a life and death test. And he's just experienced God. David says, trust God. Taste and see for yourself. See that God is good. You personally need to taste this. You personally need to experience God. You can depend upon God. You can trust him no matter what you're going through. It's through the testing of God is his invitation to intimacy. Verse 9, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. In the middle of these two invitations, we find it's a call of God, it's a call of a life of obedience, of devotion to call to God, to fear the Lord is a call of a life of obedience to Him. The 
There are many people that we could consider in numerous places in the Bible that, we, that speak of being tested of God. We can look at their lives and see that God is inviting them into a deeper faith, into an intimacy with him. And I think one of those people is Abraham. Abraham was to take his son. He, he hadn't had a son, but he was promised a son. And, and when God blesses him with Isaac, God comes to him and he asks him to sacrifice his son. And as a father, I can't imagine what that would be like to be asked to sacrifice one of my children. But it says that Abraham's commitment, it didn't waver. It says early the next morning. He didn't wait, but it's the next morning he got up early and he left. He traveled three days to the place that God showed him. He puts his son on the altar. He binds him and he raises the knife to kill him. And God stops him. God responds to Abraham. He says, now I know that you fear God. That you love me. That you're committed to me. Because you have not withheld your son. Your only son. The faith The intimacy, the relationship of God and Abraham is amazing. And we see in Hebrews 11 that Abraham is recognized for his faith in God. I think Abraham would agree with David and say, taste and see. Job, another man who was tested he was tested incredibly. He, his possessions, his livestock, his children, his health, it was all taken from him. How does Job respond to God? He says, I know God is testing me, but when this is over, I will come forth as gold. Job, he's giving testimony here to God, to his faithfulness. He said, I've followed God faithfully. I've been obedient. I've lived a life devoted to God. Job's faith was purified like gold. Job trusted God even when he was encouraged to turn away from God. His wife and his friends were against him, but he did not waver in that moment. He pursued God. In the book of James, James begins his letter by addressing and talking about the trials and the testings of our faith. He writes these words, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The testing of our faith, it produces a maturity, it produces a trust in God. We experience the closeness of God, the goodness of God in the midst of testing. The invitation to taste God. It comes through our, our intimacy. It comes through times of testing. A life that is committed to God is a life that lacks nothing. It is also a life that has everything. The second invitation that we see is in verse 11. Come, my children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. I will teach you, I will show you, I will display a life that is committed to God. As we look at this last part, it brings us to our last point. Righteous living. What are the benefits? What does it look like to live a righteous life? And as he begins to go through these last verses, it says we are to guard our tongues, our speech. We are to be careful what we say, to not lie or speak falsely. 
Think of this as it applies to David's life. As he writes these words, he's done nothing wrong. And yet Saul is wanting to kill him. It's because of the jealousy that's within Saul, his anger, his, his fear of losing his throne. That's the reason he's going after David. Saul literally wants to kill him. He wants him dead. But we see David, he doesn't fight back. He doesn't slander or lie or come against Saul. David says, turn from evil, do good, seek peace and pursue it. As you look at his life, there's actually a time when David and his men, they sneak into Saul's camp at night. And his men just say, just kill him, now's your chance. And David says, no, I'm not going to kill him. David knows and sees that God is attentive. He hears, he listens, he delivers. And most importantly, he's close. He's right here with us. Verse 19 again speaks of the righteous person. It says they may have troubles Never think that because you're pursuing God that you're seeking to live a life of peace. You're seeking and desiring to live righteously that your life will be trouble free. I would say it's quite the opposite. God does us, allows us to experience troubles and testing. In John 16, Jesus is speaking here. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Our last verse gives us promise. It gives us a promise to hold on to those who run to God, those who look to him. They will never be condemned. He will never turn you away as his child. No, he will not turn you away because he delights in you. He will redeem you. This morning, I pray that your heart has been encouraged. I don't know the journey that you're walking or the season of life that you may find yourself in right now. Maybe God has done something incredible in your heart and your heart's just overflowing this morning and you're worshiping and you want to tell everyone what God has done. He's answered a prayer. There's a relationship that's been restored. And you're praising God. He's brought a job to you that you've been praying for for a really long time. Rejoice and you want to tell your friends, you want them to rejoice and worship with you. And I would say, praise the Lord, let's do that. But maybe you're walking through a season of life where God is testing you. You sought to live a righteous life and people are coming against you. It seems like your enemies, they might overpower you. You don't know where to turn or who to trust. Be encouraged this morning. Jesus is reaching out to you. Taste and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. This is an invitation for all. It's an invitation for us to grow in our faith, in our intimacy, in our relationship with God. He wants that relationship to become deeper. And it is through the seasons of testing our faith becomes richer. No, the Father, he doesn't want to destroy us. He doesn't want to push you away. Actually, he desires to draw you close. He wants you to come to him. He invites you into a deeper part of his love. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this psalm. 
thank you, Lord, for who you are and that we can worship you, that you hear our prayer and that you are with us every moment. You are with those who are struggling, those who are going through difficult times, who are being tested. You are reaching out to us that we can taste and see that you are good. You are so good, Lord. Thank you that we can trust you. Lord, I pray that as your children that we would live lives of righteousness, that we would live rightly, that we would pursue a life that brings you honor and glory. Thank you for your promises and praise you that we can come to you as our Father and that you delight in us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.